Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Master Jesus. Good evening, Father. Good evening, Son. Good evening, Holy Spirit. Good evening, brethren. You're welcome to the King's Chamber, Lekki, the Citadel of Favor. We thank God for the privilege to be reaching you and to be bringing the Word of God to us this evening. This is our midweek service that we have tagged, Equipping the Saints and Communion Service. Our midweek service is where we have a Bible study, where we look into the Word of Liberty, where we are taught of God, where we are impacted of God, and where we then get equipped to face the challenges of the everyday life. Um, we also break the bread and partake of the communion um, as given to us as an instruction by Jesus, where as we take the communion, we believe that there's a release of life and virtue. Praise the Lord. So you're welcome to the King's Chamber, Lakey, the Citadel of Favor. Um, this is our midweek service. We trust that you'll be abundantly blessed even as we go into the service. We welcome you. We ask and we pray that God himself will visit you. Please do um, contact your friends and your loved ones and tell them to join in. We go straight even into a time of praise and worship as we are blessed by the ministry of um, the world-renowned, world-famous Sinaj. It is coming from my heart. Be blessed. It is coming from my heart Friends of God's you long All the things that you have done I'm grateful for your love I give you the praise It is coming from my heart Raising things to you, Lord All the things that you have done I'm grateful for your love I give you the praise I'm counting my blessings Just like I give it to myself I'm not all the earth done so much Oh, Jesus did it again I'm counting my blessings Just can keep it to myself when I thought that he has done too much Oh, Jesus did it again Oh, on the mountain tops Oh, I shout it now on the mountain tops Praise and thanks to you, Lord all the things that you have done, I'm grateful for your love. I give you the praise. It is coming from my heart. Praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord. For all the things that you have done, I'm grateful for your love. I give you the praise. I'm counting my blessings. I can't give it to myself When I thought that he has done too much Oh, Jesus did it again I'm counting my blessings I just can't keep it to myself When I thought that he has done too much Oh, Jesus did it again Oh, I shout it now from the mountain stuff. I can tell it enough. Oh, I shout it now from the mountain tops. I 
Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We give him praise because we shout praise and reasons to rejoice and shout may never and will never cease from our mouth in Jesus' name. Okay, so very quickly, we'll continue from the series we've been running. Uh, we've been running this series for the past couple of uh, months, uh, the last um, uh, um, one and a half months. We've been running the series on what we've tagged the Personal Spiritual Development Series. The personal development, spiritual development series, personal spiritual development series, and our text is taken from Second Peter chapter one, verse five to ten. Second Peter chapter one, verse five to ten. Personal spiritual development series. Second Peter chapter one, verse verse five to ten. And I'll read. And besides, and besides this, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And had forgotten that he was purged of his own sins. Verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. If you do these things, you shall never fall. Praise the Lord. So, if you remember, we have been running this series and we're looking at the things that we are supposed to do that will make us to be, that will make us such that we're not barren, that will make us that we are bound. And that will make us never to fall. So these things, the writer of the book, Peter, Apostle Peter says that, if you do these things, I guarantee you, one, you will abound. Two, you will never fall. Three, you would increase. So what are those things that we are supposed to do that would make sure that we never fall, that will make sure that we will abound, and will make sure that we never fail? And we, we see this, these nine things in the place that we have read and we've looked at them we've talked about um diligence number one two faith number three virtue number four knowledge number five temperance number six patience number seven godliness number eight brotherly kindness and number nine charity or what we call love so peter says that if these things are you and they are bound, that is, they increase, an ever-increasing measure. These nine things will make sure that you never fail. And these things will make sure that you profit. You are profitable. Praise the Lord. And these are the things that are required for our personal spiritual development. So if you say you are maturing in Christ, if you say you are growing in Christ, you need to grow in these nine things. These nine things need to find growth and expression and increase in you. Praise the Lord. So, again... 
we've looked at and we started we have looked at the first we have looked at diligence we took time to look at diligence we've then moved on from diligence we looked at faith from faith we looked at virtue from virtue we looked at knowledge from knowledge we have looked at temperance and last Wednesday we looked at patience so today we'll be looking at godliness godliness and if you have missed any of the series please just go to our youtube uh, youtube handle and you see the the past messages there or our facebook this facebook page you see um the you see the series there or on instagram at the king's chamber lecky underscore at the king's chamber lecky underscore if you go to our instagram page or our facebook page facebook is tkc lecky or our youtube page you'll see the past messages it would be nice for you to just catch up on them the series we have, we have talked about we have talked about uh virtue we talked about diligence faith virtue knowledge temperance patience praise the lord so today we'll, without much ado we'll look at god in it now remember what we're talking about personal spiritual development how do i grow how do i remain rooted and grounded in christ how do i ensure that i remain established in christ and peter is assuring us if these nine qualities are found in you if these nine character traits are found in you if these nine building blocks are in you and they grow they will make you so that you'll not be unfruitful that is to say you'll be fruitful basically that you'll not be unfruitful means that you'll be you'll be fruitful you abound and then you will never fall praise the lord so that's a guarantee and we it will do well to take it and to stay true to them so very quickly we'll look at godliness which is the next building block now i have here in the outline that paul anytime paul wanted to talk about you know the essence of the christian life and anytime paul wanted us to focus on the christian life he would always talk about godliness he said for instance in timothy chapter titus i beg your pardon titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 13. let's look at titus titus chapter 2 titus is just before hebrews um titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 13. titus 2 11 to 13. For the grace of God, which bringeth salvation, hath appeared unto all men. Now, this grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly, we should re- live righteously, and we should live godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So, Pete, Paul admonishing title says that the grace of god has appeared to all men and this grace teaches us that we must shun ungodliness this grace teaches us that we must embrace godliness this grace teaches us that we must live soberly and we must live in hope of the appearance of our lord jesus christ so grace teaches us to 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 shun ungodliness to embrace self-control and godliness praise the lord so now paul in his letter to Timothy, his son, in First Timothy, if you look at the, if you if you take time to read the first uh, 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 epistle of, of Paul to Timothy, First Timothy, he mentioned about living godly and godliness in a couple of chapters. Paul emphasized godliness in his first letter to Timothy. For instance, in First Timothy chapter two, verse one to one and two, First Timothy chapter two, the first two verses. Let's read it. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. I exhort therefore, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable, and um, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. In all godliness and honesty. So we see that uh, um, Paul admonished, you know, that. Prayers should be made for all men so that we can live a can, we can live in all godliness. So godliness is important. We are told to pray for those in authority so that we can live a peaceable and quiet life in all godliness. We are to train ourselves to be godly. We are to pursue godliness. First Timothy chapter six and verse eleven. Paul again admonishing Timothy says that we should pursue godliness. First Timothy chapter six and verse eleven. First Timothy six eleven. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, follow after godliness, follow after faith, love, patience, and meekness. So we should we should forsake things that are, 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 are worthy, but we should pursue righteousness and godliness. Praise the Lord. So 
we are told to pursue to go after the things that are godly. In First Timothy, Timothy chapter six and verse six, First Timothy chapter six and verse six, Paul says, "But godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain." But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So we see in so many places that Paul emphasized the, the importance of godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain. That is, it has a great reward. We should pursue godliness because it has great dividends. We see in uh, um, 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, where it says that prayer should be made for all men so that we can live a peaceable and we can live in in God, a peaceable and godly life, we should, we should live in, in godliness. We see in First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11 that we should pursue godliness. So, we see in all of these places the mention or the emphasis on godliness. Praise the Lord. Now, for Peter, Peter said to us in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, that we should, um, uh, we should not, we should look forward to the day of the Lord because we should live. Holy and godly life. Second Peter, Second Peter, chapter three. Second Peter, chapter three, verse ten to twelve. Second Peter, chapter three, verse ten to twelve. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to live in all holy conversation and godliness? In all holy conversation and godliness. So we should live holy in we should live holy and in a godly manner because the earth will soon pass away. Praise the Lord. So Peter uses the most momentous event in all history to steer us as Christians to live holy and godly lives. We should live holy and godly lives. It is the privilege and duty of every Christian to pursue godliness. It is our responsibility. Godliness is a responsibility we should pursue. We are supposed to train ourselves to be godly. We are supposed to study diligently and practice godliness. God has given to each one of us everything that we need to live a godly life. So if you go back to that, our text, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 god has given to us everything that pertains to life and godliness so we are so we have the equipment we are equipped to live a godly life second peter chapter 1 and verse 3 according as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness god all things that pertain to life and godliness we have been equipped with all that it takes to live a holy and godly life Praise the Lord. So we are admonished to pursue godliness. We are admonished to pattern our lives after the things that make uh, for godly living. Praise the Lord. So the question therefore is that what is godliness? What are the marks of a godly person? How does a person become godly? So what is godliness? We have, we have said that we've seen Paul, we have seen Peter pos- uh, encourage us to pursue godliness. But what is godliness? Most people will perceive godliness as being godlike or to be being Christ-like. So if you say godliness is being like God or being like Christ, yeah, you are not you are not wrong. Or some people say that is be is is being manifesting the fruit of the spirit. That godliness is manifesting the fruit of the spirit. Uh, you know, in Galatians chapter five, that godliness is manifesting the fruit of the spirit. Some people say that godliness is exhibiting the Christian character. That godliness, when you exhibit the Christian ca- character, you are godly. That's godliness. All these things are correct, but they are not in itself 100% describing godliness. So, to look at godliness or to understand godliness, we're going to look at a character called Enoch. We look at a man called Enoch. Enoch in the Bible, we know, and we'll see the attributes or some of the character traits that would describe godliness. So, let's look at this man called Enoch. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. Genesis 20, chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. Let's look at Enoch so I can understand godliness. Genesis 5, 21 to 24. And Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. 
And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch were 300, 360 and 5 years. Verse 24. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Praise the Lord. So the first thing we see is about Enoch is that the Bible says that and Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. So the first thing that strikes us is that Enoch walked with God. And the Bible says that it was not for God took him. Now let's look at something else that was said about Enoch in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. So we see in Genesis 5, 21, 24, Enoch walked with God. Let's see another testimonial of Enoch. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before this translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch pleased God. So we see two things combined. Enoch walked with God and Enoch pleased God. Praise the Lord. So here are two important clues. Enoch walked with God and Enoch pleased God. Enoch's life was centered on God. God was the focal point and the essence of Enoch's very existence. Enoch walked with God, he enjoyed the relationship with God, and he pleased God. Enoch was devoted to God. So, when we talk about godliness, godliness is absolute devotion and commitment to God. Enoch walked with God, and Enoch was pleasing to God. So, when we talk about godliness, godliness is a life that is 100% sold out to God, a life that is devoted to God, a life that is 100% God-centered. Everything about that life is God-centered. Enoch walked with God and he was not. Enoch was not mindful of the environment. Enoch was not mindful of this of, of his, uh, uh, of his um, society. Enoch was not mindful of his family. Enoch was only mindful of one thing, and that is God. Enoch was 100% totally, completely sold out and devoted to God. So when we talk about godliness, godliness is a life of absolute devotion and commitment to God. Godliness is a life of absolute devotion and commitment to God. Godliness is a life of absolute co devotion and commitment to God. The New Testament word that is translated godliness in its original meaning conveys the idea of being past, conveys the idea of being a personal attitude towards God that results in action that is pleasing to him. So, godliness is taking an action of devotion that is pleasing to God. So, it's not just by word of mouth, but it is living out a life that is pleasing to God, that God himself will say that it is pleasing, your life is pleasing to me. The Bible says that an enough work with God and it was not, for God took him. He was translated. Before that time, there was a testimony that he lived a life that was pleasing to God. So, a, a godly life is a life that is devoted to God, that is sold out to God, and that has that testimony that God indeed is pleasing. If you remember during the uh, baptism of Jesus, the Bible says that the heavens opened and the voice spoke and said that, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. There was a testimony. God gave the testimony that, uh, that is pleased with Jesus. Praise the Lord. So, this personal attitude towards God is what we call devotion. Devotion is always based on action. It is not just an emotional feeling about God. It is not just feeling or singing or just whatever. It is a devotion that is born out of action. Praise the Lord. The practical demonstration of devotion. So, godliness is a demonstrated, actionable devotion towards God. Let me repeat myself. Godliness is an actionable, demonstrable action of devotion towards, towards God. Praise the Lord. So, when we talk about devotion, devotion is not just mere activity. It is an attitude towards God. The, this attitude is composed of three elements. The fear of God, the love of God, and the desire for God. So, if you say that you are godly, or you are devoted to God, three things must immediately be obvious. Number one, you must have the fear of God. Number two, you must love God with your heart. And number three, you must desire God. You, you must have, you must pant after God. 
the psalmist says, I think Psalm 42, that as the deer pants after the water brook, so my so my soul longeth for you. So if you are living a godly life, a godly life is one that is totally 100% sold out, devoted to God. And this devotion is born out of three things. Number one, the fear of God. Number two, the love for God. And number three, the desire for God. Praise the Lord. Note that all these three elements focus upon God. The practice of godliness is an exercise of or discipline that focuses upon God. From this Godward attitude arises the character and conduct that we call godliness. So, for us to say that we are godly, we must be God-centered, God-focused. We must have the fear of God, we must have the love of God, and we must desire God. Above everything, above all things, above even the, the breath we have. And what it means, therefore, is that God first. When we say God first, it means that nothing compares, nothing, nothing comes close to the desire for the things of God. So, where you need to suffer inconvenience, you need to suffer loss, you need to suffer uh, 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 um, pain, whatever it is, for the sake of the kingdom or for the sake of God, you will gladly do so. If you are going to suffer maybe deprivation or suffer persecution or suffer denial of whatever, for as long as it's for the sake of the kingdom, you would not even think twice about it. You willingly suffer this loss for the sake of the kingdom. And that is what is called devotion. And that is godliness. Praise the Lord. So I have here that so often we try to develop the Christian character and conduct without taking the, without taking the time to develop a God-centered devotion. So you cannot develop a godly character if you are not God-centered, if your devotion is not towards God. A lot of times, believers, we assume and it's wrong as well. We assume when we, you know, are lost in worship, we lift our holy hands, we are singing, or there's a melody or melodious song that we are dancing and we have a nice time in church. We think that that is the devotion to God. By the way, it could be, don't get me wrong. But the devotion that is acceptable to God, it is one that is God centered, that God is the center. Because sometimes, if you are not careful, our worship is centered to us ourselves. Oh, I have a good voice. Oh, I can sing very well. Oh, I, I can mix music. Oh, I can beat the drums. Oh, I can do all of those stuff. And then we, 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 we become the center or trying to play good music becomes the center of what we do. I always tell people that you can have a quartz voice and you sing a song that is pleasing to God. Meanwhile, you can have a melodious voice, you have uh, the best voice, and your song is not acceptable to God because it starts from the heart. It is the state of the heart. Who is that song to, supposed to glorify? Is it self? Are you showing off? Or are you singing it to the glory of God? The heart is what matters. Like somebody said, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. So you must make sure that your devotion is God-centered. Don't try to do anything that is not God-centered. Any, any act of devotion that is man-pleasing, any act of devotion that is to show off. For instance, oh, I've just done three days prayer and fasting, uh, three days marathon fasting. You know, I didn't eat, I didn't drink, and I'm showing off. I'm, it is no longer God-centered. I'm just trying to impress man. I'm trying to show that I'm spiritual. I'm building spiritual muscle by claiming that I've just done 40 days dry fast. Drive fast, 40 days. Kai, I try very well. All of those things are not God-centered and not acceptable. So you have just gone on hunger strike. So please remember that godliness is an act of devotion that is God-centered. It is an actionable, practical demonstration of devotion that puts God at the center. Our devotion signifies a life given to God. God is at the center of a godly man's thoughts. His most ordinary duties are done with an eye to God's glory. So anything you do, whatever you do, you are doing it with God at the center and God as the ultimate. So even when you pick up a job, you are doing it to glorify God. Even when you are on vacation, you are doing it to glorify God. Everything you do, God is at the center. That song that comes to me, at the center of it all, you know, you're all that I see. God must be at the center. It is absolutely important that God should be at the center of everything that we do. That is when our devotion is truly geared towards God and then we can, we can claim to be living a godly life. Praise the Lord. 
in Paul's words to the Corinthian church, he said that whether we eat, whether we drink, whatsoever we do, we should do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. Whether therefore you eat or you drink or whatsoever you do, anything you do, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That is the ultimate. That is godliness. Do all to the glory of God. So whatever you do, make sure that God is taking the glory. That is godliness. So godliness is pointing to Christ, putting the searchlight on Christ, making Christ the focal point, making him the center. So whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, driving, walking, talking, having friends, whatever, make sure that Jesus is the center. Praise the Lord. It is obvious that such a God-centered lifestyle cannot be developed and maintained apart from a solid foundation of devotion to God. Only a strong personal relationship with the living God can keep such a commitment from becoming oppressive and legalistic. What are we trying to say here? Now, for you to make Christ the center, for Christ to consume you and take you over, for Christ to be your total, you know, your, your, your essence, it is absolutely important that we must have a solid foundation of devotion to God. Our lives must be so that we must have made a conscious decision. And hear me, and hear me very well. You are born again, thank God for your life. But you know, you need to get to the point where you have to consciously, just like the same way you gave your life to Christ and you openly confess Jesus, you must also get to the point where you openly declare to yourself that nothing matters, nothing compares to a life sold out to God. You must get to the point where you say to yourself, nothing compares to a life of absolute uh, uh, um, devotion to God. It must be conscious. It, it cannot be subconscious. It must be, you must get, you must be able to point to that at some point in my life, I made up my mind that everything I do, everything I have, everything I own, every all my being, all everything about me is sold out to God, is devoted to God. You must make that decision. You must make that conscious you know, declaration. It must be obvious. If you have not done that, please, you need to do so. Godliness is the is at the art of devotion. Godliness is at the art of devotion. Godliness is at the art of devotion. Praise the Lord. So, godliness is at the art of devotion. You must be born from that perspective. Praise the Lord. So, godliness must be born from the heart of devotion. And we said that if you have not, if you have not laid a solid foundation of devotion, you are not able to say that you actually are living a godly life. Only a strong personal relationship with the living God can keep such a commitment from becoming oppressive. John writes, and God, I beg your pardon, John writes that God's commandments are not burdensome. A godly life is not worrisome. But this is, a, this is true only because a godly person is first and foremost devoted to God. So a godly person is sold out to God. A godly person is one who is who says that my life must be pleasing to God. A godly person is one who walks in the precept of the Lord. A godly person is one who seeks out what you know WWJD. What would Jesus do? What is the purpose of God? What is the will of God in this matter? In this particular matter, what is it? You know, what would God have me do? That's a godly person. A godly person is one who would set aside his own agenda. Who set aside his own purpose? Who set aside set aside his own personal feelings? Whose, whose personal destiny does not matter, but is only interested in God? What would Jesus have me do? What is God saying in this matter? That's a godly person. A godly person will not mind even if he suffers, like I said, suffers a personal uh, 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 loss or suffers a, a, a personal injustice. But if it will promote the kingdom, if Suffering that loss promotes the kingdom. He's willing and ready to do that because he believes in godliness. Praise the Lord. Devotion to God is the main spring of godly character. And this devotion is the only motivation for Christian behavior that is pleasing to God. Let me take that again. Devotion to God is the main spring of godly character. Again, I repeat, devotion to God is the mainstay or the main spring 
for a godly character. So if you want to live godly, you must be sold out to God. There are no two ways about it. You must be committed and totally, completely sold out to God. God all the, all the way. God 100% of the time. And this devotion is the only motivation for Christian behavior that is pleasing to God. It's because you are sold out to God. That's why you would in you would um, 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 you would absorb or you would tolerate you know injustice. It's because you are sold out to God. That's why you would accommodate people who malign you, and you will not try to seek revenge because you are sold out to God. That's why you know when things are going wrong and. You want to, the devil tell you to cut corners. You will not cut corners. You will not lower the standard. You will not compromise because you are sold out to God. You be is either God comes through for me or nothing. Is either God hundred percent or nothing. I'm not going to try to do it my way. I'm not going to, you know, uh, um, cut corners. I'm not going to try and, and and do it the way the world is doing it. The world will tell you that you are a fool. The world will tell you that you are you are you, you, you have carried this religion too far. The world will abuse you, say all of those things. But you know whom you are believed. You are holding on to the you are holding on to total commitment to the things of God. Praise the Lord. So that's, that's godliness. So even when sometimes things don't outright don't really go out well as you expect them to go, you don't you don't complain, you don't murmur, you don't lower the standard, you don't compromise, you don't throw your hand up in your hand and say, you know what, I give up. I've, um, I've tried, I've waited on God, this is not working, I give up. No, you still wait on the Lord because you know in whom you have believed. Praise the Lord. This motivation is what separates the godly person from the moral person. And now this is it. So, you, do you know that people can be moral? So, you have a moral person that says that, oh, I don't lie, oh, I don't steal, oh, I don't covet, oh, I don't uh, commit fornication, adultery, oh, I don't, um, I don't, um, you know, uh, falsify stuff. Oh, I don't commit fraud. Oh, I don't embezzle. Oh, I don't wish anybody ill. And he's a moral person. He's speaking from a moral compass. He's speaking from a moral standpoint. That person, if he's not devoted to God, if he's not sold out to God, it's just a matter of time before his morality will be tested. We have seen people who are moral, quote and unquote, but later on they fall like a pack of cards. Why? Because Morality is not what would keep you above board. It is a life sold out to God. It's a life of commitment. It's a life of godliness. So it is that motivation that we know that we are living a life pleasing to God that separates us or that distinguishes us from a moral person. Because otherwise, a moral person will be seen to be good. I mean, somebody who says to you that I don't lie, I don't wish people well, um, I don't wish people ill, I don't fight, I don't da 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 da, is a moral person. Without Christ, without the sustaining ability of God to help him to keep to that promise, without that motivation, that person is just a matter of time. He will pack, he will pack up. It's just a matter of time. He will fall. It's just a matter of time. He will, he will be compromised. People have had people say that, you know, anybody has a price. It's just whether the price is right or not. People are, 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 are tempted and are, are sometimes will, will cut corners because their price is right. So they will say, oh, name your price. I'll give it to you. So you, are, you need to be careful because don't pursue morality. Mor being moral is okay. But beyond morality is the absolute motivation born out of a life sold out and devoted to God. Praise the Lord. So this motivation, the motivation... To live a life for God, to be devoted to God, is what separates the godly person from the moral person or from that benevolent person or from the zealous person. In fact, you can be zealous, right? You are zealous for the things of God. You are zealous for the kingdom. You, are, you have zealousness in you. But if you are not, if that zealousness is not motivated from the point of devotion, after a while you burn out. After a while you can get tired. After a while you 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 be exhausted. After a while. You, 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 you can get discouraged. So that's why Paul said, you know, in, in, in his letter to the Romans, I think Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 11, he was saying, he was comparing the Jews that, see, these guys, they have a zeal, but zeal without knowledge. Because they are pursuing things that they, they, they are using their human ability, human muscle, human, human uh, 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 capability to try to reach God. You cannot reach God with your human strength or ability. You will burn out. You will burn out. You get tired. You get discouraged. You 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 may even be tempted to just pack it up and backslide, because you are trying to do it based on your human 
ability. But the moment you are committed and devoted to God, God makes available the grace. That's why the Bible says that it gives grace to the humble. God makes the grace available to you to be able to live a godly life. So living a godly life is born out of a total a life of a life sold out to God, and the ability to live it is given by God. No man can live a righteous life by himself or born out of his own ability. It is God that gives the grace to live that godly and, 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 and right life. So even if you are zealous, make sure that your zeal is channeled and patterned after a devoted life. The godly person is moral, yes. The godly person is benevolent, yes. The godly person is also zealous, yes, because of his devotion to God. And his life takes on a dimension that reflects the very stamp of God. When you are when you are when when you are devoted and you are a godly person, your zeal for the things of God, your benevolence and your moral compass is now situated in God and you are a better person for it. Praise the Lord. It is sad that many Christians do not have this aura of godliness about them. This may be very, they may be very talented, they may, they may be personable, they may be busy doing the things of God. In fact, they may apparently be seen to be succeeding in Christian service. But, there's a but. There's a but. For as long as they are not devoted to the things of God, they still may not be godly. So don't get it twisted. Don't mix up the fact that somebody is working in the vineyard of God. Somebody is, you know, um, laboring. If it's not godly, that labor is not acceptable be- before God. That labor does not pass, you know, the ceiling. So before you start to labor, before you start to be zealous, before you start to be, um, you know, all of those things, first things first is that you must ensure that you live a godly life, a life that is devoted to God. So it's out of that devotion that God will entrust to you the things that you need to do to succeed. Praise the Lord. So, you can be zealous, you can have talent, you can be busy, you can even be seen to be successful, but for as long as you are not godly, those things are not acceptable before God. Why? Because they are not devoted to God. They may be devoted to a vision, may be devoted to a ministry, may be devoted to a reputation, but if Christ is not the center. If God, remember what we said, if God is not the center, God has to be the center. For your devotion to be acceptable, for your zeal to be acceptable, for your benevolence to be acceptable, for all those things to be acceptable, it must be that Christ is the center. Everything is originating from Christ. So your zeal is towards the things of God because Christ is the center. Your resources, your money, your offering, your tithe, your time, your talent, everything that you give to God must be because God is at the center. You are not giving to God because you are at the back of your mind. I say, ah, if I, if I, if I sow a seed of 100,000 in a couple of weeks, I will reap 1 million. No. You have, you have turned God to jackpot or you have turned him to Kalu Kalu. You have turned him to pool. No. It's not like that. You give 100,000 not even thinking whether the re- reward will come or not. Whether the harvest will come or not. You are, you are sold out to God. There's a need for 100,000. You give to God and full stop. You see the difference? The difference between the guy who gave saying that, oh, uh, the, the Bible says I give and shall be given unto you. You, are, you give because you are, ex, you are expectant of a multiple fold. You have turned God to a vending machine. That's not why you give. The motive for giving should not be because there will be a hundredfold return. The motive for giving should not be because ah, I give now because I trust that I'll get a hundredfold back. No. The motive for giving should be from born out of love. The motive for giving should be that I want to give to the kingdom of God. I want to give for the expansion of the kingdom of God. I want to give for humanity. And you are not thinking of you know multiple fold coming your way god sees your heart god knows if you are if if it's your heart is not that state god knows so if you have come to god out of is out of a zeal that is not born out of devotion then it's not acceptable before god so everything we do everything we do the service we render to god in the in god's house our personal lives our marketplace our career our family Everything should be centered on Christ. Praise the Lord. So, godliness is more than Christian character. It is Christian character that springs from a devotion to God. Let me take that again. Godliness is not just a mere Christian character. It is a Christian character that springs from a complete, total devotion to God. So, you exhibit this character bore out of the fact that I'm sold out to God. 
Praise the Lord. I am sold out to God. Nothing can take me away. Nothing can yank me from Him. I am 100% sold out to God. That is when you know that your godliness is acceptable to God. Praise the Lord. So I said that godliness is more than Christian character. It is Christian character that springs from a devotion to God. But it's also true that devotion to God always results in godly character. So, you know, if you are devoted to God, automatically you would exhibit, you know, godly character. Because you, it would be, what would WWJD, what would Jesus do? In that situation, in that circumstance, you are considering Jesus because Jesus is the center. If somebody has offended you, before you lash back at that person, if somebody has crossed your path or done something wrong, before you lash back at that person, you take a pause and say, what would Jesus do in this situation? And if Jesus will not lambast that person, you keep calm, you hold your code, and then you talk to the person in the next way. That is when you say your devotion, your, 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 um, your character trait is exhibiting godliness. Praise the Lord. The essential elements of devotion must express themselves in a life that is pleasing to God. Godliness can be defined as devotion to God, which results in a life that is pleasing to Him. Praise the Lord. Let me take that again. Godliness is de- can be defined as a devotion to God, which results in a life that is pleasing to Him. So remember, you remember Enoch, where we started from? Enoch, Enoch walked with God. Enoch's life was pleasing to God. And those two character traits, the Bible says that, and Enoch was not, for God took him. Enoch exhibited that godliness. So Enoch walked with God, and Enoch, you know, um, pleased God. Everything about Enoch was pleasing to God. That's why God said, "Is my f- he, 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 this one, I can't keep him here. I need to bring him to my bosom. And it was translated, praise the Lord, and it was not. So that was Enoch. So the devotion or the godliness that we're talking about must be one, a genuine love for God, a genuine total being sold out to, for God and doing the things of God. And then you can have, have that testimony that says, you are pleasing to God. Praise the Lord. So godliness is defined as devotion to God, which results in a life that is pleasing to Him. Godliness is defined as devotion to God, which results in a life that is pleasing to Him. Enoch worked with God and Enoch pleased God. His work with God speaks of his relationship with God and his devotion to God. His pleasing God speaks of his behavior that arose from that relationship. Let me take that again. Unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, let, let me take it again and then I'll explain. Enoch worked with God. So he worked with God. Enoch pleased God. So two things. Enoch worked with God and Enoch pleased God. His work with God speaks of his relationship with God. So if Enoch worked with God, had fellowship, had communion. So Enoch and God had Jojo. Enoch worked with God. It was a relationship, right? Now, and that was his uh, um, devotion to God. Then the Bible says, and Enoch also pleased God. Pleasing God speaks of his behavior that led to that relationship. So Enoch did not take God for granted. Enoch did not abuse his friendship with God. Enoch did not, um, Enoch did not act like, you know, uh, over Sabi or God was his pali pali. Even though he worked with God and God decoded certain things to him, yet he had the reverent fear of God. And that is why God said, his life was pleasing to him. So, our life must be pleasing to God always. Praise the Lord. Now, it is important, rather, sorry, I beg your pardon. It is impossible to build a Christian behavior pattern. It is impossible to build a Christian uh, behavior pattern without the foundation of a devotion to God. So, if you are going to build a Christian character, we are going to develop, you know, the, the, just growing in, in Christ. You must ensure your foundation is rooted in the devotion of God. So, what do I mean by that? So, in the morning, when you're having your quiet time, do you remember that God is the center? Or do you rush through your quiet time, say your prayers with the Bible, and just rush off and just jump off? If God is the center, if God is the essence of your your, your daily devotion, if God is the essence of your family, if God, wherever you, wherever you place God, you must ensure that God has the first, middle, and final say. Praise the Lord. So, in that instance, we don't rush off from the presence of God. Retain some time before God. Let God say to you, okay, my child, I've had a good time with you. Go to work. Go and achieve whatever. Praise the Lord. So, Enoch, what we God, and Enoch, please God. 
the practice of godliness is first of all the cultivation of a relationship with God. So that's what we said. We must cultivate a relationship with God. So if we are talking about godliness, godliness speaks to a relationship with God. You must have a relationship with God. And from this cultivation of relationship of, of, of a life that is pleasing to God, our concept of God and relationship with Him determines our conduct. So if you love God, if you are if if, if you if, if you have the heart, if you have the heart of God, if you have the mind of God, and if you truly uh, you know desire the expansion of the kingdom you would ensure that your life you examine yourself examine yourself paul said that examine ye whether you are still in faith so it's important we examine ourselves to know that we are still devoted to god anytime that you are not sure please just go back to god and say god i want to be 100 percent 100 percent sold out to you that is the ultimate praise the lord <clears throat> our concept of god and our relationship with him determines our conduct our concept of God and our relationship with Him determines our conduct. Finally, we have already seen that devotion to God consists of three essential elements. The fear of God, the love of God, and the desire for God. We can see, we can think of a triangle representing devotion to God with these three elements as each of the three parts. You know, we can say that these things are critical. When we talk about devotion to God, these three things are critical. Number one, the fear of God Number two, the love of God. And number three, the desire for God. Praise the Lord. We will pause here. We will continue next Wednesday by the grace of God. We will be looking at those three things in greater details. We will be looking at the fear of God, the love of God, and the desire for the things of God. Because we need this topic of godliness to sink in. So that we do away with the former mindset. When we talk about godliness, and we think godliness is just being a godlike or Christ-like. Yes, you need to be Christ-like, you need to be godlike, but it must be actionable. Action here means a hundred percent devotion. You are sold out, you are totally committed to God. Praise the Lord. So, so when we talk about godliness, godliness the, the, the places a huge demand on us. Godliness places on us a demand for hundred percent, hundred percent or nothing. And I pray that God will help us even to achieve. 100%, 100% com- complete total devotion to God in Jesus' name. So like I said, we'll continue next Wednesday. I'll be looking in greater details. What do we mean by the fear of God? What do we mean by the love of God? And what do we mean by the desire of God? And as we continue, God will help us in Jesus' name. I want us to quickly get ready to participate in the communion. I told us at the beginning that this communion, uh, this service, this midweek service is our equipping the saints and communion service. Why do we break the bread? We break the bread and we participate in the wine as a symbol of what God has achieved on the cross of Calvary. It's a symbol of what God has achieved on the cross of Calvary. So when we break the bread and when we take the drink, we remember our, our faith level is inoculated. We remember that Christ has already achieved so much for us on the cross. What did Christ achieve for us? Salvation, deliverance, healing, wholeness, prosperity, and all of these things. So when we participate in the communion, we remind ourselves that, hey, young man, remember, if you are sick in your body, Christ has procured healing for you. If you are poor, remember, Christ has procured riches for you. If you are confused, remember, Christ has procured clarity for you. If you are down, remember Christ. You know, so that's when we participate in the communion. We remind ourselves of who we are in Christ. That Christ shed His blood to achieve these sins. The blood of Jesus that was shed is not only for remission of sins. Yes, for remission of sins, so that we are, we are born again. But the blood of Jesus also speaks to healing, speaks to protection, speaks to so many things. So please remember that when we participate in communion, we remind ourselves. So the communion is a reminder. It says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So the communion brings us into remembrance of the great and glorious things that Jesus achieved on the cross of Calvary. So please go and get the bread. If you don't have bread, get cake. If you don't have cake, get biscuit. If you don't have biscuit, get wafers. Just, it's a symbol. Get the Ribena. If you don't have Ribena, get Coke or Fanta or Sprite. Just something to symbolize the, 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 the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Father, we sanctify the elements. We pray and we ask, O God, that this becomes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. As we partake of it, let us receive healing, let us receive wholeness, let us receive clarity and direction. Lord, speak to us, bless us. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. So take the bread and eat.
Take your mind and dream. Hallelujah. Lift up your voice and begin to give him praise. Thank him for the gift of today. Thank him because today is the last day of this month. Today is the last day of this second quarter. Today is the last day of the first half of the year. Thank God for God who has allowed you to see today. Give him praise, give him glory, give him honor, give him adoration, give him thanksgiving. And thank him because God who has kept us to see the first six months of this year certainly will keep us to see the second six months of next year, of the second six months of this year in Jesus' name. And we'll see even next year and many, many, many more years in good health, in sound mind, in fullness of all things in Jesus' name. Now, tomorrow being the first day of the month, first day of a third quarter and first day of the second half of the year, we'll have what we call early morning settlement prayer, 6 a.m. Early morning settlement prayer at 6 a.m. at number 42, or by Yekine Legunshi Street, Ikate Chisco bus stop. Please, we want to encourage you to come and start the day. Come and start the new month. Come and start the new quarter. Come and start the second half of the year powerfully with prayers and prophetic declaration establishing the purpose of God in the news in the second half of the year. The, remember, the Bible says that better is the end of a tenth year than the beginning thereof. So come and establish your second half. That second half will be better than first half. Come and establish that as you go into the stu, in, into H two, it will deliver greatness for you. Hallelujah! So I invite you six a.m. tomorrow, physical in the in the auditorium. We'll also be live on free conference call. So if you are living far or you are not living in Lagos, you, know, you can join us on the free conference call and then we would also flow there. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you. Father, we worship you. Father, we adore you. Father, we glorify you. Thank you, Father Lord, for the beginning of this study on godliness. Lord, some of us might have had misconceptions, but today we have a better understanding that godliness is speaking to actionable devotion totally completely sold out to god lord we pray and we ask that you help us to achieve this in jesus name let our lives oh god speak only of your kingdom let our lives reflect you let jesus be glorified we pray for all our members those who are not able to join we ask oh god that you quicken them and let everyone be blessed let the blessings of today be a, a permanent upon us thank you father we pray oh god for everyone who is tuned in online or on site bless us all and Lord, give us a special body package. For those of us who are faithful, let your faithfulness continue to show for us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. I share the grace together. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. I shall dwell in the house of our Lord forever in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 16, verse 11. For the Lord will show us the path of life. For in His presence is fullness of joy. At His right time, there are pleasures forevermore. The Lord bless you. The Lord increase you. The Lord multiply you. I see God still doing something even before the end of this day. Before the end of this first hour. And I see God glorifying you even as we join together to pray tomorrow at 6 a.m. Number 42. Or by Yekine Legunshi Street, Ikate Chisco Bus Stop. God bless you. Have a pleasant night rest and End half one gloriously and begin half two powerfully in Jesus' name. God bless you. Shalom.